Hello, everybody. Macro Trends, Kirk Spano, May 12th, the day before Friday the 13th, and a birthday party for my fiance Jolene. We will be going out to dinner at a local Mexican restaurant. I'm then going to do game show battles, which I am likely to be on the losing team because I will be that much of a weight around their shoulders. Yeah, it's a kind of a neat thing. You go to a bar, they have rooms, and they set it up for game shows. And I think we're playing something that's like Family Feud, something that's like Price is Right. Yeah, they don't have like, you know, name that widget for economists or something like that. I'd be okay with that one. Or or literature for people who uh, study too much literature. I, I'd probably do okay with that one too. All right, so we're going to talk about the thing that everybody wants to talk about, but mainly because I just want to get it all the way. Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, big crash going on right now, although it kind of uh, froze in place today on, on the Bitcoin. And, you know, NASA Nicholas Taleb, who hasn't put a lot of study into uh, Bitcoin, is basically saying that Bitcoin is nothing. Yeah, well, you know what? Gold is nothing. Oil is nothing. Stocks are nothing. Real estate is nothing. You know why? Because if nobody wanted it, the price would be zero. But the price of Bitcoin is 28000 and it was 65000 or 63000 So even though it's down 60 70%, somebody still wants it, so it must be something. It's not nothing until it goes to zero. I'm telling you this, it's not going to zero. Here's why. Because 84% of institutions and big investors believe what I said here, that Bitcoin is a store of value. And just so you understand why it's a store of value, it's because one person can hold it. There's a finite amount. That's the key. There's a finite amount and it doesn't depreciate. And importantly, it doesn't have a carrying cost. It has a super teeny tiny carrying cost, but it's like measured in pennies, like over long periods of time. Land has carrying costs. Gold has carrying costs. Oil has carrying costs. Anything physical has carrying costs, and it's subject to depreciation. Bitcoin is not. Bitcoin doesn't have carrying costs, and it doesn't have depreciation. So that's why Bitcoin is worth something. Now, is it a tradable investment right now? Yes. Why? Because it's very early in the adoption phase, maybe second inning. But as soon as the next wave of billionaires and corporations and family offices and other types of institutions that need to have a little cash that doesn't depreciate, think scholarship funds, pension funds, start to buy Bitcoin, and they already are. And when a few more countries allow it to be treated as a currency, it's not just El Salvador, there's more thinking about it, then the price of Bitcoin will go back up. When will that happen? Probably this year, not 10 years from now, probably not even two years from now, this year. And when you put pen to paper like I did with Professor... Sean Stein Smith in that interview we that we did, actually in both interviews, you can't come to any conclusion, but the price of Bitcoin is going to go between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand dollars per Bitcoin. It could very well go into the millions. I think that that would require a few more nations to accept it as currency, but strictly as a store of value for the wealthy and for those who need a long-term cash position that doesn't depreciate. It just a fraction of 1% of all the money on the planet going to Bitcoin, which is what I used. I used seven tenths of 1% of the world's money goes into Bitcoin, seven tenths of 1%. I got a price of between 300,000 and 500,000. And, and actually, I just used dollars. I didn't use all the other countries' currency. I just used the dollars. I probably did the math wrong. I literally did it on a piece of scrap paper. I haven't really taken the time to figure out exactly what it should go to under certain assumptions because the assumptions are going to be wrong no matter what. But just on very conservative basis of certain types of investors using it as a store of value and a handful of countries using it as legal tender, you can't help but figure out on accident the price of Bitcoin is going to go well into the six figures and it might go into the seven figures. Now, once it gets to the point of adoption, Right, it's it's in it's on the hype cycle. Once it gets back to the just being adopted phase, it'll be it'll be in a range. It'll it'll be mature at that point. It'll stay within a range, the same way that gold has. Right, we got that big rally from gold. What was it in 1999? Three hundred dollars an ounce. It's eight times that, seven times that, whatever. 
but it's been chopping along between 1900 and 1900. Did it hit 2000 for a hot second? From 2012 to now, right, for the last decade, gold has been range bound. It's round tripped in reverse from 1900 down back to what, 1100, back up to 1900. Eventually, Bitcoin will start doing the same thing. And you'll have your Bitcoin bugs the same way you have your gold bugs. You'll have all your stupid arguments about why gold is going to 10,000, the same way they'll have your stupid arguments that Bitcoin's going up to a number that's way bigger than what it's been range bound for for a decade. That's exactly what will happen. I'll write it into a book someday. If I'm not too lazy, I'll, you know, I'll probably just stick it in an article. I'm too lazy to write a book. But that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. It had the spike up, came down, and now it's on the wiggles until it finds what its plateau is. And its plateau is probably 10 to 20 times higher than today's price. So last night while I was watching the Bucks, and I got frustrated because they were down like 13 or something in the fourth quarter. I started playing Coinbase, started reading the headlines, seeing what was going on with this stupid um, stable coin that's unstable. And I noticed that Bitcoin was like 28,000. I was like, well, that's under the 30,000 that I told you it was going to get to when it was 60,000. Not quite as low as the 20,000 I think it might get to, but it's pretty close to a price that I would consider bottom fishing. And I know that bottom fishing doesn't happen every time. Sometimes we stop short of bottom fishing. So I bought a little Bitcoin last night for 28000 I had money sitting there waiting for a chance to buy it under thirty. So I could have said, hey, there's a lesson in this. There's a lesson in this. I could have said, well, it might go down further, so I'm not going to buy any. I'm afraid it'll go down another $7,000. Or I could have taken part of the money, like a third of it, which is what I did, and bought some Bitcoin. And if it starts to have a confirmed rally up that's confirmed, right? About a four-week confirmation is, is normal. I'll buy more. And maybe I don't buy it again until it's 35000 But if it looks like it's heading to sixty, it's still a pretty good buy. Or maybe there's another leg or two down, and I can get it for 20000 And then I'll buy more with what's left of my money. Pretty simple. That's probably what we should be doing with a lot of assets. I got irritated in one of the chat rooms today. Not like real irritated, but like Man, am I not making myself clear, irritated? Look, you need to start setting good till cancel limit orders for everything you're going to do. And then you come back and you adjust those limit orders at least once a week, preferably at the end of the market every day. If you're waiting for an alert to make you go run to the computer and trade, you're doing it wrong. I'm telling you you're doing it wrong. Stop doing it wrong. I'm going to go Bobby Knight on you. I'm going to start throwing chairs across the gym. I'm going to make you go watch a video on how to become a basketball player for soccer players who grew up in Greece, but then you'll turn out to be pretty good. Use limit orders for everything. And if you want to scale in, you have one little order at the higher price and then a bigger order at a lower price. And then if the first one triggers, you probably set another order even lower. And if you're watching the market chop along and there's pretty good downward momentum and your order hasn't gotten hit, the top order, you can move down a little bit. If you don't have about 10 good till cancel orders out, you're doing it wrong. And you don't have to commit all of your money, but you should have the next move planned. And you can do that by watching the prices, having your list. These are the 12 things I most want to own. Here are the six things I most want to own. And that's how you do it. It's in the getting started articles. I'm going to rewrite those too, to just be real streamlined and say, do this, do this, do this. Because I've learned that's what you want from me. These webinars are for me to just, you know, roll off of my tongue. But in the writing, I, I've, I have discovered you just want simple. Although today's article, I thought I was pretty funny. Earlier this week, I wrote an article, here's why I was a buyer yesterday. You actually got this ahead of the free people on Seeking Alpha. I did add to this a little bit. This is a little different than the version that you got. So I do think you should go here and read it. Because I, you know, encouraged you to buy a little bit of ARC this week. And when PBW was under 40, a little bit of that. It was only there for a hot minute. But if you had a limit order at 40 for ARC and for PBW, like I did, you got them, you got them both. Now, you can complain that, well, I didn't get 39 or 38. I got 40. So what? You're going to miss the orders running to the computer more often than your limit order is going to mess you up. Just make sure your limit orders are tiny. Because when you get that alert from your brokerage 
and you go and look at it, you say, oh, you want to add it? I'll add a little bit. I actually did that with ARC. It hit me at 40, and I went and looked at it. I was like, oh, look at that. It's like 38 and change or something. So I bought a little bit more. So suddenly, ARC, which was 100 and what, 135 at one point, and that kid told me I was out of my mind when I said, I think it's going to go down to 60, right? Because I wrote, I wrote that first chart and he goes, so you think the arc's going to 80? And I said, no, I think it's probably going to the 60s. And he quit. He quit fundamental trends over that. And here we are, arc is around 40. And ultimately, I think we're pretty close to the bottom on that because when you take a look at the top 10 holdings, what you see is that all of these are down between 30 and 80%. So all you really have to do is go to these companies, several of which are trading at book value, Say, will they be in business in a few years? That's how cheap a lot of this stuff is getting. I reminded everybody of some of the things that I talked about way back in 2020. Remember, I didn't pound the table on this. I just said it. I posted it. But I didn't yell at you to buy, right? If I had yelled at you to buy these things, it been a lot happier, right? So that's what I learned. I learned that I have to pound the table a little bit more often. And actually, I did pound the table earlier today in one of the chat rooms, I have a new a new file, GIFs. You know, that's the right way to say that. It's GIFs. Oh, fried food stone, pounding a table GIF. It didn't work. Oh, well, some of you saw it. You saw the Fred Flintstone pounding the table GIF today. If you were over at Fundamental Trends, I think. And maybe I put it at, at where, where did I pound the table like Fred Flintstone? I bounced back and forth between the chat rooms. Oh, there it is. There he is. Ha 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 ha. So I'm going to pound the table more often. A case. You take a look at ARC. And that was actually in a that was a private article for all of you, right? Last night I sent out the trade alert for ARC. I showed you. Look at these stocks. These are the ARC holdings. Look at where they are in their 52-week ranges. Tesla is the only one not at a 52-week low. So here's the question they ask: How much more of there can of that can there be? How much more pain can there be with the ARC stocks? Unless we get the Armageddon zombie apocalypse. Not much. And that's the question that everybody has. Is are we going to get the Armageddon zombie apocalypse? It's really the wrong question to ask. The bulk of the correction as of today has pretty much taken place. The only thing we haven't gotten, and I think the old men are getting better or they have less money to uninvest. I don't think we've gotten a lot of old man selling. And I don't think we've gotten the indexers to sell. And there's an awful lot of rich person money on the sideline because they have been accumulating cash for a year. If you were watching Bloomberg today, you saw one money manager go, yeah, I'm looking at the SPACs. So stop thinking about today's narrative, which is inflation, and start investing in tomorrow's narrative. Now, you're going to need to get some money really invested here imminently in the next month or so. And you should probably be starting now, this week, maybe get about a sixth to a third of your cash invested over the next few weeks, between now and the end of June, because the narrative is going to change soon. Somebody says, I have heard you say that there's at least one more leg down in the market as the lack of liquidity has not yet hit. Well, here's the problem. The market has anticipated. NASDAQ's down 30% now, right? Give or take, 29. SPY isn't quite down 20. And that's the last place you're going to see it. But I just showed you the stocks in ARC. And, we can, and I showed you the small caps and the mid caps the last couple of weeks. 50, 60, 70, 80% down. Back to prices that we last saw in 2019 and almost all the way back to the prices we saw in 2018. So we're basically at the price levels of just before the COVID crash, which is a price level that I told you about a year ago. A year ago, I looked it up. Over a year ago, last spring, I told you in April, last April, that we'd probably go back to the spot just before the COVID crash. And then at that point, it was hard to know. Would the millennials and the Gen Zers flip the switch and become prolific put buyers and cause an epic co collapse that lasted about a month or maybe two? Would geopolitics completely screw up the entire global financial system, cause a zombie apocalypse? I like the Armageddon zombie apocalypse because usually people don't mix those metaphors, and I think it's a pretty good one. Would the dollar collapse? It's done just the opposite. Would we suddenly run out of oil? No, it turns out there's actually a lot of oil. They're just not pumping it because Saudi Arabians are jerks. I had to take something out of the article that I wrote today. Um, it's still in your article in the services. So there is a little something that I wrote about Mr. MBS. 
I said, Prince MBS, the journalist killer, over in Saudi Arabia, smiles about it. All right. I had to take out the journalist killer. The editor contacted me and said, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter how many people believe that, or even if it's true, you can't say it. It's kind of inflammatory. But anyway, I, I talk about how the inflation narrative is wrong. It's been wrong since day one. I've been telling you it's been wrong since day one. And you're not going to probably believe me if you don't already believe me until all this stuff changes the way that I say it's going to change. So yes, we have inflation now, but it's not because of the Fed, which means that the Fed can't really get rid of it. And in fact, the Fed can cause more inflation by getting tighter than they can by staying basically the same. So what caused inflation for last time? It was COVID that was the linchpin. It was the boulder dropped on the teeter-totter that launched inflation. Visualize that for me, would you? Teeter-totter, some kid named inflation at one end, then a giant boulder pushed by Wile E. Coyote hits the other end, and the little kid inflation jumps up into the air. But you know what? He's going to land. He might go to the moon and back, but he's still going to land. You know, turn it into a cartoon in your head, right? How did I know on January 23rd, 2020, the coronavirus, which is what we were all calling at the time, was the biggest story in the world. And three weeks later, lockdowns earlier this year, I said it's still the most important story in the world. And one of the narratives that you just started to hear in the last week or two was what? Right? I talked about this in March. That there's some pretty wicked strains out there and those who aren't vaccinated are going to be in big trouble. So unless you have some natural immunity from having gotten it, or there's, there's a small segment of, of the civilization of society that seems to have some weird immunity to it, just like they have, you know, everybody has an immunity to something that other people don't. But the people who truly don't have any immunity against coronavirus, these next strains that are floating around are not going to be good for you. So I urge you, as somebody who was raised Catholic and was told to love everyone, even if I think you might be a shithead, no, none of you, but in general, there's, there are shitheads in society, get a vaccine. Pick the one that's least offensive to you because it just might save your life because viruses become better and worse. They get stronger and weaker. Certain flus have been very deadly for humanity. Certain coronaviruses, COVID, are going to be as well. And if we get a big outbreak in the fall, that's another one of the wild cards that could cause another damaging event to the economy. So COVID led to more expensive oil busted up supply chains, which were already on thin ice due to the trade wars. And then bailouts kept us out of a depression. Right here, that, that area right there, that's what you have to know, right there. That is the one sentence description of what happened. COVID led to more expensive oil, it busted up supply chains that were on thin ice due to trade wars, and then bailouts kept us out of a depression. Well, the bailouts brought in a lot of money. So everybody wants to talk about the bailouts caused the inflation, but not really. We know that it was mainly the oil, all right? We know that. How do we know that? Because we can measure it. We can measure it. Energy is, is, is really where most of the inflation is coming from. So as soon as there's more oil relative to demand, inflation pretty much goes away. And I put something in here about supply chains that I think you'll find interesting to read right after the oil section. By the way, I mean, this oil section is like, it's the shortest summary I could do of what happened to oil in the last seven years. Read it. And this chart's important. These are the bankruptcies after the Saudis flooded the market with oil. And then in 2018, when President Trump decided not to sanction Iran more in return for more Saudi oil. Remember when Saudi pumped all that oil in anticipation of Iran getting more sanctions? And then we said, ah, fooled you. Well, look, then all of a sudden they pumped all that oil and more of our companies went out of business. Then COVID wiped out more of our companies. Look at those spikes. Spikes, spike there. I don't know what that one caused that one. Then in here. So we lost all these oil companies in the United States. And the land is still there, but there's nobody operating them. So it's available, but not being pumped. And if you take a look at U.S. oil production, it's just a shade under right now, about 10% under the all-time high. And over the winter sometime, we're going to get back to the all-time high. Based on what Chevron, Exxon, Occidental... EOG, Pioneer, Devon, and Hess are telling us about the oil that's coming. One more company. I forgot the eighth one. And you kind of have to wonder about the zero COVID policy in China. I mean, coronavirus COVID-19 originated in Wuhan, China, 
right next to the Wuhan Coronavirus Lab. Strange coincidence, isn't it? Might want to read the uh, article I linked. So maybe the Chinese are sensitive to it. Maybe they are really scared. Maybe they want supply chains to be mucked up to cause some inflation for the United States. Screw up our whole process. You start to think again, you start to think, hmm, could the Saudis and Russia and China all just been pushing the inflation on us temporarily while they could? It was an opportunity the COVID brought them. So they took it. Let's mess with the United States. Let's see if we can hurt the dollar system, which they have a little bit. You know, what really mucked it up is that invasion of Ukraine solidified the West versus the other way around. And what's probably going to happen in Russia is some future leader of Russia this decade, maybe pretty soon, but some future leader of Russia is going to make reparations to Ukraine in return for Russia getting back into the global system. It'll be after Putin is gone. It might be two people, two leaders later. I don't know that Russia ever gives back that land because I just think it'd be hard to reverse things, but I think they do cut a big check and they make a big deal. Maybe they give it back. We'll see. But that's a very long-term thing. In the meantime, the West gets Finland into NATO. What's the other country up there that's not in, but they're probably going to come to Sweden? Looks like Ukraine will end up in NATO all of a sudden. Should have been an independent state all, all along, a neutral state all along, in my opinion, because then I don't think this all would have happened. I think that the hardheads on both sides, the hawks on both sides, led to this. I know it's not going to get me accused of being patriotic to say that we're partially at fault. Whatever, I don't care. We're partially at fault. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't roll takes, tanks in there. I mean, it's still more Putin than us, but our complete lack of empathy and understanding and bloodlust for Putin, you know, Ukraine became a pawn, much like Mongo in the Game of Life. So all this inflation narrative is wrong. I can prove it. This is the chart you really got to watch. PPI. PPI is what shot up. What does PPI represent? It represents the supply side, the producer side. If the cost of capital gets too expensive, that makes it hard to produce. We can't make the cost of capital too high. We can't cut liquidity too much, or the supply side can't keep up with the demand side. And the inflation spreads until you have a big downturn in demand and you get a recession. And during the front half of the recession, you probably have stagflation. And the back half of that recession, you have unemployment. So you're not going to see the Fed tighten the screws too tight because if they do, if, if little old me can figure that out, right? A guy that, you know, granted, I mean, I knew COVID was kind of a big deal. But if I can figure this out, don't you think the people who publish this can figure this out? You can't wreck the supply side. If you wreck the supply side, you're screwed. So what's the next narrative? What is it? I think you'll like this if you haven't read it. Play a little music with it if you like. In the not too distant future, inflation is going to turn over right around Labor Day, a little before, a little after, hard to tell. The only way that doesn't happen is if something gets wacky with oil or COVID uh, gets worse in China and they decide to stay on lockdown. I mean, there, there is a chance that this autumn things are about to get bad, better and Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China prevent it. Why? A, they like screwing with us, and B, the election. But Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China together aren't as powerful as the United States and the trade bloc and the financial system that we control. Not even close, really. Maybe half as strong. Maybe. Depends if India's on our side or neutral. I think right now they have to be neutral because they have to buy Russian energy. But they don't like China. And they don't like be, being energy dependent. I will tell you what. I have quite a few Indian friends, a few of them who are pretty, I'd say, semi-big deal guys. And the one thing that I know is that they're pragmatic, have ridiculously good senses of humor, actually, and they don't like to be messed with. They don't like to be under anybody's thumb. And I don't know if that's pervasive in Indian society. I, I don't know. I do know it's pervasive among the people I know, who are people who have done pretty well for themselves. And I'm sure the caste system, going back, even though it's not official anymore, I'm sure they're on the right side of that, or at least the less bad side of that, right? None of them grew up in a slum. But if you've been paying attention to Modi, even though he's a hard guy sometimes, he does not want to be under the thumb of Saudi Arabia or China. And he's going to work his way away from that. And the two richest people in India are pushing 
clean energy hard. They are committing the bulk of their multi-billion dollar fortunes to it. And that's why I say that solar is going to take off and it's going to be huge in India. And that's why it's one of our focus places to invest, India and alternative energy. It's why Ametis, which is now $7 a share, is being gift wrapped for you based on the upside in that company with their business in India and their business in California. It's being gift wrapped. You don't want to trade it, don't trade it. When it gets super cheap, buy it. So the last time we got a chance to buy it under 10, you should have. And this time when it's under 10, which might be the last time, <clears throat> you should buy it. So the next narrative here, because of the way all these things are headed, it's going to be this one. Inflation is turning over. I think by around Labor Day, but again, something wacky happens a little bit, a little bit after that. But if inflation isn't going to crush us, then why do we need the Fed to tighten? Hmm, maybe we don't. Now, the Fed's tightening, it might slow down growth. We don't really want that. So maybe the Fed shouldn't tighten. See how they'll talk their way into that? You know when they'll do it? Right after they have their trade set up. And that's when those people, the big traders, the people who profess to be big deals, the ones who embraced the spotlight, which if I ever do, and I don't know if I can at my age, maybe, maybe, but the opportunities I had, I, I didn't go to. But if I ever do, so partially because I'm an angry, angry man. And I just want to yell at people who deserve to be yelled at. Wouldn't that be great? You know, you all have a list. If you just had a chance to yell at all the people you felt like yelling at and you could get away with it, just for just for an hour. <laughs> you suck and you suck and you suck and you suck. Come on, it would feel pretty good. All right. So the Fed can't tighten too much because it'll, it'll ruin the supply side. They just need to bring the cost of housing down a little bit because that's what they affect the most. And they need to bring down the price of assets, right? I've posted this a couple of times. If stocks don't fall, the Fed needs to force them, right? That was the, I forget which Fed president it was that said that, but you know, they told you, they telegraphed it. And last week when I told you about Atlanta Fed President uh, Bostic being on Bloomberg saying, yeah, we're going to tighten into summer until until July. And then then we'll see what happens and we'll figure out what to do from September on at the September meeting. Telling you, I don't think they ever get the $95 billion of quantitative tightening. And today, Shooter pointed out that there is a whole bunch of action where what have I told you is going to be the spot where money finds its way into the stock market indirectly. What market? What does the Fed have money just sitting there waiting to help out with? Ah, oh, come on. I've, I've used this term a hundred times. Yeah, there you go. The repo market. So something blew up in the last 24 hours. It wasn't gigantic. It wasn't, wasn't small either. And they put some money into the repo market. And the Federal Reserve bought U.S. Treasuries. Wait, wait, wait what? I, I, that sounds like QE. Yeah. They're really just managing their balance sheet. But uh, don't be surprised if the way they manage it seems an awful lot like QE on the down low. So when you take a look at QQQ, and you go, wait a second, we're, we're, we just got into the buy zone? Wait, but, 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 but it was just a few months ago that we were way up here, over 400, right at 400. Now it's down to 300. It's down to over 25% already. Whoa. It doesn't have a lot to go for this to be about as bad as it's going to get. Because it'll get to this level here, which is just above the, where the COVID crash started. This is probably where it stops because the people who made the most money sold starting in here all the way to the top and all the way over. This is where I'm actually going to draw this for you. Where shape ellipse. There you go. There. This was basically the area where the wealthy sold all the way up and your trend followers saw the trend break. So they sold, got your little rebound rally because all your smart sellers were out and now you get some panic which has weirdly been a very orderly panic. So if we get a rally, probably thin up on your positions a little bit, maybe get that le next leg down, and then we have to evaluate at the time what's going on. Are Saudi Arabia, China, and Russia trying to screw us up and send us into the Armageddon zombie apocalypse? Or are we a couple months into the future? And the Fed's like, hey, we were able to break inflation for the most part. We can start to see oil coming down, which... I will drink a beer for anybody who can tell me what is the signal that the price of oil is going to come down. I've mentioned 
particular country, the particular oil company has been told they cut a deal with by the U.S. government. What is the signal that the price of oil is going to come down in the very not too... Sh- That's right. Somebody put it out there. When you get the news that they're loading ships with oil for the United States out of Venezuela. That's it, man. We are within a year of the panic pumping beginning. What is the panic pumping? The panic pumping is going to be when oil companies realize that Russia accelerated, and and Saudi Arabia too, by gouging on oil for the last year, that they accelerated the clean energy revolution, especially with that new battery that looks like is going to be real bring the cost of EV batteries down in half, probably five, six, seven years, right? They just got to get it from, you know, workshop to, you know, floor. And they're going to panic pump. All these countries that need to sell oil so it doesn't get stranded in the ground, they're going to they're gonna pump it. And the countries that can't sell the oil, but they have it, they're going to use it. So we might get four, five, six really smoggy years. That's it. That'll be oil's last hurrah. And then demand for oil turns over right around 2030. All the math supports it because the car companies are going to be selling. They're going to have more cars on the market that are EVs than they will have on the market that are ICE vehicles. By definition, that means they'll sell more of them. Ford will not be producing ICE vehicles in Europe as of 2027 and only a handful in America by 2030. And I think that that gets accelerated. GM, 2030 and 2035. But they're already moving heavy towards EVs. Kathy Woods, by the way, invested in GM. Didn't put it in the uh, innovation fund, but put it in the automation fund, which again, I think is interesting because what did I tell you about Ford a couple of years ago? All the fourth and, uh, fourth industrial revolution technology, the AI, the robot, robotics, machine learning. GM's got it too. Not quite as good as Ford as I don't think, but, but close enough. The inflation narrative is on its last hurrah. The oil narrative is on its last hurrah. All these things are going to change. And when they change, it's not 10 years away from now. It's in less than two. And it's probably this year. Might be the very end of the year. We'll see over the winter. Again, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, they can be a thorn in the side. But I don't think China you know, wants all those people angry at the government. I mean, they're sensitive to that. They know that even with the guns, if you really had... A billion Chinese people want to get rid of the Chinese government, they can do it, especially if certain generals take the other side of the bet. All these things are fluid at a certain level. If they get outside the guardrails, watch out. The leaders know that. So should you be buying a little bit of QQQ right now? Sure. Because what if what if there's an announcement from Saudi Arabia, hey, we're going to add a little bit more oil, or we're going to make up for the oil that could be pumped that other countries aren't pumping because they can't. So what if Saudi Arabia made up for the Libyan oil or the Algerian oil or whoever? What if they made that announcement one weekend? What if Biden called them up and said, look, man, I'm sorry if we're getting off on the wrong foot. You know, he'd stutter a little because he's a stutter, right? People want to say he's stupid for that. Don't buy that. The guy's brilliant. He just has a little stuttering problem that he's dealt with his whole life. He says, Prince, Prince MBS, the journalist killer. I won't bring that up anymore. And... We'll give you a really good deal on fighter jets and, you know, we'll help you out with that little problem to your south and we'll make sure that Iran doesn't bother you. But we just want to do it on a down low and um, why don't you make up for the oil that some of these other countries aren't pumping and you can claim that you pushed us around. And we'll get the oil and everybody gets a little something and Prince says, yeah, sounds like a good idea. I have squeezed you enough. Probably wasn't going to be able to do it much longer anyway. Let's figure it out. What if Putin gets shot in the head? What if she says, you know, we've had enough people vaccinated that we're still going to wear masks at work, but we're going to work. What if the president says to the shipping industry, if you don't unload those boats now, don't ever unload them. Take them somewhere else, right? President of the United States says, kiss my ass, you're in trouble. Right? If he decides that he's in a lose-lose situation anyway, If he's in a loser situation, he'll turn it into a lose-lose situation, right? Mutually assured destruction. Game theory, folks. You know, there's a little book out there on game theory. Uh, I think they're called the Little Book Series, or I haven't read this in like 15 years, but uh, from uh, from the Harvard Press, maybe, or the Oxford Press, short, short, little short stories on, on different topics. They're pretty cool. Game theory. Everything here in the markets is game theory in the short term. Intermediate term even, right? 
in the long term, valuation and business execution all matter. In the short term, right? When when folks try to say, well, but valuation shouldn't be that high in a year, well, the difference doesn't make. In the next year, it's just which direction the herd is running. The rich people soak up most of the supply of something that they want. And then the middle class people try to buy up what's left and push the price up. And the rich people sell it to them at the end. And then they go and buy the next cheap thing or cause a cheap event. One reason I know that uh, that QQQ won't go down too far is that I categorically guarantee you that Berkshire Hathaway will buy stocks like Microsoft and Amazon and Alphabet and NVIDIA if they get much cheaper. They'll hold up that index all by themselves. So QQQ, you know, in here somewhere is probably where you need to scale in. I haven't done it yet. I'm super close. I kind of want to wait till Monday to see if we get like a really bad open after the weekend. But I'm almost as fearful of the thing shooting up. So I will tell you all the things that I said to buy this week and sell puts on. I did those things. I'm down to about 20% cash for the hot minute. I have a lot of puts that may or may not get put to me. So I could be up to 50% cash quickly, depending on how that works out. But I don't have... 40-50% 40-50% dry powder at the moment. I have 40-50% to 50% powder, but some of it's wet from the cash-secured puts. So I personally am waiting a little bit on buying QQQ, but if you're still at 40-50% to 50% dry powder, sell some puts, nibble a couple of ETFs, the ones that you were targeting anyway, set some limit orders, right? It should all be limit orders for the most part, and tweak those limit orders at least a couple times a week, but really after the market each day. I mean, you, you should be able to get managing your portfolio down to two hours a week. Should be. You don't have to watch this stuff to catch a price. Look at your charts. Know what you want. Set your limit price. There you go. So last week, somebody asked me about 401ks. I'm getting a question again about 401ks. If you're 60% cash in the 401k, like I said, take one sixth and invest it in aggressive equities, growth equities, right? Because because tomorrow's narrative, tomorrow's narrative is going to lead to the realization that I don't know, technology is still king, right? So QQQ, or if you want to, and QQQ I use because you can trade it real easy. If you just want a long-term position trade position, I really like this iShares Evolved US Technology ETF, IETC, right? Because it's, it's large caps and mid caps. So it's kind of like having QQQ and QQQJ but includes the things that are on the S&P 500 and some things in the Russell 2000. Still top heavy in the QQQ stocks, still top heavy, you know, but you get Salesforce, right? Salesforce isn't in the NASDAQ 100. Accenture was just such such a good basket, you know, and and, and with IETC, you get a broader range, right? You get some financial stocks that aren't in the uh, NASDAQ 100, IBM, HP. it's, It's a good fund. If you want something a little bit more diversified, going to take up a little bit more of your portfolio to great holding. And then if you want to trade the ebbs and flows, right? If you want to trade 10 to 20% of your portfolio, you can use QQQ for that. And the new article coming out on Sunday is going to be basically focused around trading QQQ relative to uh, TLT and SPY. And I'll be doing that one in conjunction with Shooter. And we're going to put that up on Seeking Alpha a few times to get people to come on over and visit us. But that'll be a part of the Global Trends series. Uh, I'm going to call it Major Markets uh, Technical Tracker, I think. Something really, really boring. But um, Seeking Alpha's got a technology section now. Excuse me, a uh, technical trading session section. So I'm going to introduce Shooter to the world. Uh, but I'm going to copy edit him because... Even I have a hard time following him. I have to literally think about the things he says. So, all right. Um, I think I hate banks. Somebody says, I thought you hated financial stocks. No, I hate banks. Brokerages almost always make money, except Robin Hood. And I've told you my thought on banks. I don't want any of the big banks in general. I don't want US Bank. I don't want Wells Fargo. I don't want Bank of America, right? Because they're so economically sensitive. I just don't want to deal with it because their rallies aren't big enough. The only time you buy those banks is off of a crash. JP Morgan is clearly the best one, but they have blow up potential. So I would, if I was going to own an individual stock, I'd rather have Apple and Microsoft than JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan and Bank Bank of America, I guess would be a better example. But FinTech, I love. The brokerages make money, especially off of corrections. And in the case of this 
this fund, right? You think about it in the context of this fund, not buying the individual companies. I wasn't talking about buying the individual companies. I was talking about the fund, QQQ versus IETC. I'm just telling you what the differences are. If you want to stay more aggressive, stick with QQQ. If you want more of a core holding that's a little bit more diversified by market cap and by industry, IETC. Is that how I should have said it right off the bat? Probably. All right. Somebody asked me, what's my take on Coinbase? I think, remember when it was 200 and 180 and 160 and I told you, I said, I'm having a hard time figuring out what the bottom is on Coinbase. I don't know how low it can go. And I said, I thought it could get into the 80s or maybe the 60s. Well, here we are. And where is it? 60? At this point, right? The chart makes you throw up. So you stop looking at the chart. And this is going to apply to somebody who just asked about YOLO as well. When the chart looks so bad and the asset is so cheap, just ask yourself this question. Is it too cheap for what it's really worth, right? Technicals eventually take a backseat to valuation when valuation gets super cheap because that's when the technicals are prone to break because that's when you're going to get a value hunter with big bucks come in and blow up the chart by buying a whole bunch of something. My guess is that Coinbase is within weeks or days of having bottomed, right? There you go. 360. Now it's 60. For whatever reason, it's up after hours. Who knows why? Was that the bottom? I don't know. It'll probably go back and hit it again. And does it go through a little further? It might. But if you've been interested in Coinbase, do one of two things. Either buy a little bit and sell an out-of-the-money uh, cash secure put, or do what I did, buy some ARK. So my thought on Coinbase is this. I, I own it now through ARK. And if it breaks down the 10 or 20, I can, I can I can buy it then. Because I've already answered the question in my head. I don't think it's going out of business. I think the nature of its business will change. But I think it's so entrenched and the slow consolidation down to a handful of coins will allow it to navigate what it has to go through. And as the price of Bitcoin goes up, it'll rise. So I told you I accidentally bought some of that DAPP a while back. Um, that was the one I didn't really tell you about. I added a little bit to it yesterday. But I also had that limit order on block, and I put that in the chat. Uh, the chat. So I sold $20 puts on BLOK, not the, not, not the stock, but the fund. And I have a pretty big position in uh, blockchain technology all of a sudden, I guess, and fintech probably four, five, 6%. So I will summarize that. There's so much happened so fast, right? That's why the folks in the chat got to catch it. So I, I like Coinbase, I guess is the answer. I just don't know if it gets another level or two cheaper, but I own it through ARC. Yeah. All right. I am going to go plant my flowers. It's 80 degrees here. People are in the pool that they just opened up in Wisconsin on May 11th. They opened it yesterday. I can't remember the last time the pool was open this early, like anywhere in Wisconsin. I'm telling you folks, I don't care what you call it, but it's getting warmer. It's getting warmer a lot of places. There's just an article in Bloomberg maybe, uh, but it was talking about the heat in India and Pakistan. There, there is a lot of reason to start burning less fuel. So these trends aren't going to change, folks. We're not going to be able to fix climate change in our lifetime, but we should be able to stop causing more of it in the next 20 years. And that is really going to push alternative energy, which is why if you own oil investments, you really need to find a way to sell them. All right. Have a good rest of the night. Oh, bucks and six. <laughs>